another topic. I can't believe we're almost halfway through. It's about uh, 12 uh, past 12 p.m. I'm so excited to uh, have uh, one of my mentors in this uh, work. I have uh, known Nicole Smith and Nicole Willis for some time now, and I always go to her for guidance in terms of what we do. Our presentation or her presentation today is a pillar of um, our fundamental policy, if we can call it that way. We don't have a, um, a sickle cell policy, so to say, for sickle cell disease. We fall under the rare diseases um, um, umbrella. And uh, Nicole Millis uh, is in charge, or she's the CEO for Rare Voices Australia. And she's going to talk about the national strategic plan, which uh, we had before Honorable Greg Hunt talked about. So I'm excited and I just want to thank you again, Nicole, for supporting our organization and uh, for supporting this conference as well. So welcome to this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Agnes. And, and thank you to your team as well. Um, very, uh, very pleased to be here today. Now I'll just um, share my screen. I'm the CEO of Rare Voices Australia, which is the national peak body for Australians living with a rare disease. And ASCA is one of our uh, very valued RVA partner organisations. And while sickle cell disease is a common condition uh, in many parts of the world, here in Australia, it is very rare. So today I'm gonna to speak about the Australian government's national strategic action plan for rare diseases, and indeed the role of rare disease policy in this country. Okay, so as I said, RVA is the peak national body um, and the work, our focus is on progressing policy and system change to benefit Australians living with a rare disease. Um, as well as being the peak body, our work is very much focused on systemic advocacy and policy. We also provide, um, we also work in the areas of education, um, particularly around education of our um, partner organisations, and also increasingly in recent years, um, doing more and more work influencing research, um, advocating for further investment into research, but also um, increasingly um, partnering with researchers um, and, and with consumer co-design. Our focus and expertise is on um, policy and system change um, and to address challenges faced um, by the rare disease sector. We work in partnership with about 90 rare disease organisations um, and we're very much patient-centred or person-centred. However, we know that we uh, must work with all stakeholders and we work in a, in a number of ways, both um, informal ways and partnerships with researchers clinicians, government and industry. And I guess in recognition of the relationships that RVA had with the sector and our role as the peak body, um, in recent years, the Australian government commissioned RVA to lead the collaborative development of the National Strategic Action Plan for rare, disease, rare diseases. So the action plan is the key policy or the key rare disease policy framework in Australia. And why is policy so important in rare disease? Well, I've got some rare disease stats here. A disease is considered rare um, if it has a prevalence of less than one in 2000. There are approximately 7,000 different rare diseases and around 80% of those are genetic. Um, and although individually a, a rare disease is um, is uh, quite rare. Collectively, rare disease as a whole affects six to eight percent of Australians. Now, that's more than the population of people affected by diabetes. And you might ask why I, I pulled that stat out. And, and the reason is, is that the Australian government for a number of years now has made diabetes a health priority, um, but has not treated rare disease in the same way. Although, as you would have heard from Minister Hunt earlier, um, that this is starting to change, um, in particular, particularly with the action plan. Because what we know from rare diseases is although there's 7,000 different rare diseases and every disease uh, in itself also has a great 
degree of variation. We know that um, across the spectrum that rare diseases actually have more in common than they do differences. So rare diseases are complex. They are life-threatening or chronically debilitating. They are often progressive. Importantly, what we also know about rare disease is that health systems and our other systems, whether that be disability, for example, our systems struggle to effectively respond to rare disease in Australia. So that perhaps uh, starts to make it clearer about why RVA in particular focuses on that systemic level. Um, and certainly for us at RVA, what we often say is that effective policy is what transforms people's lives. So the National uh, Strategic Action Plan for Rare Diseases. So although the development, the collaborative development of it was led by RVA, this is an Australian government policy position on rare diseases and it informs all of our um, RVA advocacy. It, is, um, it has three pillars and pillars that are named in a way that makes sense to everybody in the sector and importantly for people living with rare disease. So awareness and education, care and support, and research and data. And it provides a framework and policy direction from which the whole rare disease sector can advocate on issues that are important to them. That photo there is from the launch of the action plan, which happened um, at Parliament House in Canberra um, in February 2020. Um, and that the action plan was launched by the Minister for Health, uh, Minister Hunt. Okay, so the action plan is quite a comprehensive and lengthy document. Um, and it was informed by a uh, quite a lengthy stakeholder consultation um, that involved uh, multi-stakeholders and went around the country. Um, and one of the key things that came out of that stakeholder um, consultation was that it emphasised the importance of while we needed to have a, a comprehensive and, and far-reaching document, it also needed to remain accessible and simple enough for everyone to understand. The action plan, although comprehensive, is simple enough to be condensed to a plan on a page. And this is, um, the slide here shows part of that plan on a page. Um, and you'll see here that it shows the key priorities under each of those three pillars. So what I'm gonna do now is just have a quick look at a couple of the examples of the action plan um, or parts of the action plan where you can see where the action plan, rare disease policy and system, systemic advocacy has played a key part in bringing about high level change towards better outcomes for people living with rare disease. The, the first area that I think is a priority for everyone uh, um, in the rare disease sector, particularly patients, um, is access to medicines or treatments. It's an important priority for all those, I think, who live with rare disease. Um, I, I'm also a, a rare disease mum and it was, it was that issue, the access to medicine, that actually um, made me start uh, many years ago advocating um, in the rare disease space. A lot of RVA's advocacy work is around um, access to medicines or health technology assessment or HTA. Um, and what's important in that work is that um, we have a strong knowledge of approval processes, but also how the patient voice can most effectively influence um, and be heard within those processes. Um, and this knowledge is really important because it enables us to more effectively advocate for improved processes, processes that are um, transparent, that um, enable more effective patient involvement that are more timely and that are more accessible. So on the screen, on the slide here, you'll see um, excerpts from the action plan. And these are the um, priorities um, and actions that really talk to that access to medicines piece. Um, and you'll see as you look there that there's the um, important parts around equitable access um, to the best available health technology. And not just now, but 
in the future and the need for that um, to be supported through policy um, and really to policy that's future-proof so that it allows for new and emerging health technologies as well. Our reimbursement pathways or, or approval pathways for funding need to be fit for purpose um, and sustainable. Um, and we've also got one there which I think is a, a particular of particular importance in rare disease and that's that people have access to medicines that will help their rare disease, um, including those that are already funded for another condition. So what we find in the rare disease uh, sector um, in Australia is that often there is a medicine that is available in Australia that will help um, your rare disease. Um, and it's, um, it is available in Australia for a more common indication or a more common condition, and it's funded for that condition as well. Um, but it may, but this same medicine may not be funded for a, a rare condition, even though your doctor is saying that it, that it, it might help. Um, and small numbers of, of people with rare diseases can make it really unviable for pharmaceutical companies to put in a submission to apply for funding or to apply for reimbursement. And what we see, how that translates is that what we often see is that this one medicine um, where someone who has a common condition and that is taking it, it may cost them just around $6 if they're on a healthcare card. But someone with a rare disease or their doctor has said this same medicine will help them, they instead may have to pay $600 or even $6,000 for the very same medicine. So the action plan and specifically um, those part there and the priority 2.4 in the previous slide was one of the key drivers which led to the parliamentary inquiry into approval processes for new drugs and novel medical technologies. And RBA put in a submission um, very much aligned to what was in the action plan um, and was very honoured to be the opening speaker at the public hearings. Um, we were really encouraged that we were able to, um, and fought hard, to be honest, to be able to really position this um, uh, policy uh, work as, as very much a rare disease issue. The other, another key priority of the action plan is priority 2.2, which is around diagnosis. Um, obviously, everyone uh, in the rare disease sector understand the importance of diagnosis as the, as the gatekeeper to, to best care and, um, and better outcomes. And you'll see if you look here around, um, again, in the actions um, and implementations, we talk about the importance of again, Australians having equitable access to diagnostic tools um, and that that's the best um, chance for early and accurate diagnosis. Um, you'll also see in here that we've um, really highlighted screening programs and the importance, um, the importance that that makes. And in particular, we've also highlighted um, the need to develop policy to support um, uh, in the implementation of diagnostic tools and tests. Um, and under the implementation there, you'll see we've also, in the action plan also uh, really highlights the need for national leadership and coordination um, for um, a screening program, including the newborn blood spot screening program. You'll see that it identifies the policy around that program and it, um, and also the uh, urgent funding gaps associated. So those urgent funding gaps that, were, um, that the action plan was referring to um, and the national, the newborn blood spot screening national policy framework um, that it's referring to, uh, there's a, on the slide, there's a photo of the cover there. Um, this, newborn blood spot screening national policy framework was really important. Um, before we had that policy, there was actually no way for new tests to be added uh, to the screening program. So it was a, it's a really positive policy move and it had many strengths. 
Unfortunately, it had one major flaw. It was, in effect, policy without any funding. Um, and what soon became apparent is that there was not any ongoing funding for the assessment part um, of, the, of the policy. And, and what that meant was that even when a particular disease was eligible to be assessed, to be added, or to be considered to be added to the newborn blood spot screening program, that an assess that assessment was not able to go was not always able to go ahead, and it would just stall or effectively stop within the process and, and sit in limbo. So, as you can see, that's been highlighted. That was highlighted in the action plan, and RVA has been specifically um, effectively advocating on this issue. Uh, um, really quite strongly for the last 12 months. Um, and in recent months, in response to that work, the Australian government has responded through some policy reform, which to provide ongoing resourcing for the assessment process through the MSAC process. Now this work is still underway and there is still much detail to be worked through, um, but for sickle cell disease, it's actually quite exciting. Um, sickle cell, there is a nomination that has been put in for sickle cell, newborn blood spot screening for sickle cell disease. Um, and before this um, policy reform, there was actually no potential way forward for that process um, for sickle cell um, disease nomination to be assessed. Um, and we know this when we look at a, a, a previous nomination from another rare disease um, Excellent adrenal leukodystrophy. There was a nomination put in um, to, to add that to the newborn blood spot screening um, and um, a number of years ago um, in 2018, and it met all the criteria to, to yes, to go and be um, assessed. But because of that um, urgent funding gap, there was no funding for that assessment and it has it had never proceeded. And it's only now in 2021, now with these policy moves to reposition newborn blood spot screening assessment under MSAC, that now there is a potential way forward. So RVA will continue advocacy work to, um, done on this issue, but, but it is important to know that this is a key step. Um, and also encouragingly, in response to our advocacy, each state of Australia has improved its processes for funding implementations of positive recommendations that come, any positive recommendations that come out of that newborn screening assessment. Um, and again, I think what that shows is the role, the importance of the action plan and also effective systemic advocacy to help bring about um, this policy change that leads to better outcomes for people. Okay. So I just wanted, just to finish up, I just wanted to sort of talk about um, uh, why RVA encourages everyone in the, in the rare disease sector, whether that's patients or patient group leaders, advocates, clinicians, researchers. Um, we encourage everyone to use the action plan in their, um, in their advocacy, in their day-to-day -day fights, their day-to-day uh, you know, advocacy on, on the issues that affects them. And the reason we encourage that is that there's a key benefits of using uh, the action plan in your rare disease advocacy. It has, um, it has many strengths and credibility that can bring, uh, you can bring to your issue that will help um, uh, in, increase the impact. One, obviously, is that it's co collaboratively developed by the rare disease sector and, and for those that, that know of RVA, you, you'll see that we, we often use that message around the, the action plan being developed by the sector for the sector. Um, and that's important. It's hard for people to go against, to go against that. You know, it gives it a, a real power. The other power is even though the development was collaboratively led by RVA, it is very much, and importantly, a government policy. It has the, the Australian government logo on it. It means it's their, their policy and we can, um, we can all hold them accountable to that, to what's in that framework. Importantly, it has bipartisan support and you'll see in that photo there um, key members um, of the opposition. Um, uh, that was uh, at the time, Chris Bowen was the Shadow Minister for Health 
And also there is um, Mike Freelander, who's one of the um, chairs of the Standing Committee of Health um, and, a, and a real supporter of rare disease. Um, the other thing which I, 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 um, I think the Minister spoke of uh, this morning was that through the action plan, the politicians and bureaucrats have awareness um, of the action plan. And so when you go and speak to politicians and bureaucrats, they may not have heard of sickle cell um, uh, disease, although, Agnes, I'm sure with all your work that, that many, many do, but well, they may not have heard of an individual rare disease, but they they it is um, they are likely to have heard of rare disease in, in, in general. So, so that's, a, that's a, um, something that you can leverage. The action plan also provides some shared language and a common voice that you can use to help amplify the message of your advocacy. Um, it applies to a very broad range of rare disease issues um, and there's a strong evidence base behind the action, action plan as well. So all those things are really um, key benefits of why it's, it's useful to use it um, in rare disease um, advocacy. And look, certainly from RVA's perspective, we would be using the action plan in some way every single day um, of our work.